Hello, and welcome to Capital One City Parks Foundation Summer Stage. My name's Erica Elliott, and I'm the Artistic Director. Summer Stage is New York City's largest free performing arts festival. In a typical year, we present over 200 artists from across the city and around the globe, reflecting New York City's true cultural diversity. Until we can get back to doing what we love, bringing people to parks, we invite you to join us for weekly programs of Summer Stage Anywhere, where we bring you dance, music, and dialogue, including programs like tonight's conversation with Roger Guinevere Smith. Follow us on social media and tag us with hashtag Summer Stage Anywhere. As an independent nonprofit, we rely on donations to do all that we do. If you're able, visit us on summerstageanywhere.org to make a donation today. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Stephanie Batiste and I'm thrilled to host this conversation tonight for Capital One City Parks Foundation, Summer Stage Anywhere. Summer Stage is New York City's largest free outdoor performing arts festival and has been a major platform for presenting renowned and emerging artists in New York for 35 years. While health and safety guidelines prevent us from gathering together, Summer Stage is bringing weekly digital performances to you anywhere. Look out for more performances at summerstageanywhere.org. I'm really happy to be talking with you, uh, Roger Denver Smith, today about your work and particularly the Summer Stage performance of Rodney King. Thanks Great for being here. Great to be with you, Stephanie, in conversation. It's an ongoing conversation that we've had over a number of seasons. Uh, and um, great to be with you in this particular moment in the early days of uh, the year 2021. Yeah, it's amazing. I think that you opened the show in 2012 or 2013? 2012. The stage uh, performance. Which is when we lost Rodney King, Father's Day of, of that summer of 2012. And uh, the piece has continued to resonate in many tragic ways uh, since then. Um, I've played it all over the world uh, on stage. And of course, this film version, uh, which was done for summer stage in uh, the East River Park, uh, has shown all over the world and continues to show on Netflix. Good. It's such a powerful, harrowing production. The film really has so many of the characteristics of that live performance. Um, uh, Spike Lee's direction really brings us close to you as a performer, close to the history that you give us. Well, it's a way of, I think, illuminating things that can't necessarily be illuminated during a live performance, of course, the use of the multiple cameras mm -hmm. uh, that were uh, there in the park that evening, um, the ability to go close, closer than perhaps you could see me on stage, mm -hmm. and also um, taking into effect the environment mm -hmm. to be there in the East River Park, uh, at sundown mm -hmm. and to have the piece grow increasingly darker and darker mm -hmm. uh, as the evening uh, gets darker and darker. That was the warmest night of that particular summer. Wow. In New York. And in fact, we were expecting a uh, thunder shower that evening, which fortunately never came. There was a beautiful rainbow, in fact, as the sun went down. And if you notice, uh, you can see the East River behind the performance. And as it gets darker, you can see the vehicles going back and forth uh, on the river. Uh, quite, a, quite a setting, I think, for a Rodney King, which has so many aquatic uh, references, of course. 
That's right. And I also love the way that the city makes itself present. I think when a train goes by, you really feel the way that um, urban areas really hold so much of this violence for us. Mm. And in this uh, form, we had a lot of boats going by, mm. uh, water taxis and, and what have you. Mm. So there was that sense of, of movement uh, mm. through water. Uh, Rodney King was an avid swimmer. He loved to ski, so he loved water in its frozen uh, form uh, as well. And he was a surfer. Mm. Uh, yeah. So he enjoyed all of those typical uh, California <laughs> endeavors. And the lighting in the stage design really also helps us feel submerged in moments, um, as if you and us with you are underwater. Well, that's one of the illusions, I think, of the live performance. And I think it's captured really well in the film performance uh, as well. Uh, the Do you lighting, remember? I'm sorry. The lighting done on stage and for the film was done by Jose Lopez, my um, longtime collaborator from, from LA. Mm -hmm. So um, we all came together there uh, in that park on that evening spike uh, with a great crew of folks. And uh, we came with our uh, West Coast crew, uh, <laughs> Kirk Will Wilson running things uh, up in the booth and Mark Anthony Thompson, of course, doing mm -hmm. uh, his usual brilliant sound design. It was beautiful. Um, do you remember where you were when you saw the video of the police beating Rodney King on March 3rd in 1991? I was in LA um, at that time, and I was uh, working in collaboration with Ben R. Caldwell and Wesley Michael Groves and uh, Mark Broyard in Lamert Park, Crenshaw District of LA. And we immediately went to work. That next weekend, we were doing a piece called Chaos TV, in which we oddly predicted what was going to happen a year down the line. We predicted that LA was going to fall apart, that it was going to catch on fire. That I played a kind of CNN uh, moderator with a huge map of LA behind me. And we were pointing to places where we <laughs> uh, thought there would be conflagrations. And mm -hmm. there were in fact, lots of con conflagrations mm -hmm. uh, that next year in April, May of uh, 1992. That's right, it's really prophetic. And that imagining of the violence um, is a response in rage to the um, state supported beating of Rodney King that the rest of the Los Angeles community responded to in the same way. Um, a whole year later, um, when the police were acquitted, that kind of patience to me seems really epic. Well, also we folded in the story, of course, of Latasha Harlins, mm -hmm. who was a teenage girl who was killed uh, in a convenience store, so-called, uh, mm -hmm. in central Los Angeles. And uh, the woman who killed her did no ja jail time uh, whatsoever. And the acquittal of Ms. Sun Jadu I think had as much to do with uh, what happened in April, May of 92 as the acquittal of officers Kung, Pao, Brasino and Wind uh, did. Uh, in fact, what happened to Latasha Harlins uh, was in central Los Angeles, near the corner of, of Florence and Normandy. Uh, what happened to Rodney King actually was outside of the city uh, limits uh, proper it was way out um, off of the 210 freeway, mm -hmm. uh, a long way from central Los Angeles. So what happened there with uh, Latasha was a lot more intimate to the community than what actually happened to Rodney King. And in fact, what happened to Latasha Harlins uh, was caught on the security cam. Mm -hmm. And it was the LAPD who got those images out to the public 
so that the pressure was then taken off of the LAPD as the villains, as it were, and put on uh, Korean immigrant merchants. Mm -hmm. uh, so there became a new villain uh, created uh, through this technology. Mm -hmm. So what happened, the blow up, I think the evening of the 29th of April, 1992, had as much to do with the loss of Latasha Harlins as it did with the beating of Rodney King. Yes, and you talk about Latasha's murder in the show. She was 15 years old. Yes. And Sun Jaji got 500 hours of community service as a yes. punishment for that murder. Um, and it was, uh, regarded as a great affront uh, to the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened with the appeal of the non-sentencing uh, was that it was upheld mm -hmm. by a higher court in California. And that was in early April of 1992. So there was a kind of double outrage uh, in, in that month. Yeah, we have the police and the judicial, judicial system really as what people call structural racism. Now it seems like folks have a bit more of an awareness of that term um, and these kind of multiple uh, uh, rulings um, indicate the way in which violence against okay. black people was really condoned by the courts and the cops. Do you remember where you were when the rioting started in 92? Oh, I remember I was right in LA mm -hmm. and uh, my good friend, uh, Mark Broyard of Creole Mafia fame, uh, another uh, duet that I've performed for many years with Mark, mm -hmm. um, he called me and he said, can you believe this? Can you believe that we're doing this again? Because Mark and I had both been as children in LA in 1965, mm -hmm. uh, when uh, the city blew up mm -hmm. uh, during the so-called Watts riots or mm -hmm. Watts rebellion. Mm -hmm. um, I was pulled out of my car actually in 1992 for curfew violation. And the police were working with the uh, INS and they were actually taking people off of the street and putting them in indefinite detention and then deporting some people. And the police officers continued to ask me where I was from. Mm -hmm. And I gave them a variety of answers. Uh, well, I was born in Berkeley. Uh, mm -hmm. I was conceived in Monterey. Uh, my mm -hmm. people were from Virginia. Uh, my people are from South Carolina, or maybe you could deport me to Haiti, or, you know, I'm That's from- That's a Haiti. dangerous performance <laughs> under those circumstances. I am, I am from Sadly. all of those places. Well, mm -hmm. it uh, eventually became a performance in, mm -hmm. in 1992, where I did uh, my first collaboration with Mark Anthony Thompson mm -hmm. in a piece called Christopher Columbus, 1992. Mm -hmm. in which I played a Columbus who was still among us uh, 400 years after his so-called uh, discovery of, uh, of America. And uh, at that time, it was 500 years after his discovery of America. Mm -hmm. And um, he is a lounge entertainer who runs a travel agency on the side. Uh, he has political aspirations. Mm -hmm. So that is where that encounter went, it went straight uh, back into the theater. Mm -hmm. uh, the theater of, of conflict goes into the <laughs> theater of, of, uh, of consciousness, I suppose. So yeah, I was, I was in LA in, in 92 as well. It's really profound. It tells us a lot about uh, how you make work, the way that experience and history intertwine in all the performances that you construct? Well, when I was putting together um, Rodney King in June, mm -hmm. July, August of 2012, I had made kind of a left turn because I was 
on my way really to start a piece about Otto Frank, mm -hmm. who was the father of uh, diarist Anne Frank. Um, but when Rodney expired and I felt the way that I felt and I wanted to know why I felt that way, I had to go about doing that you know, work on, on Rodney King. You've but said- I, But oddly enough, it was Rodney yeah. King who, who reunited me with Otto Frank because I was invited to Amsterdam to perform Rodney King in a international theater festival. And it was there that I got to go to the Anne Frank house and uh, step in that same spot where Otto Frank stepped into after the war, having lost all of the members of his immediate family and having been presented with this diary that his daughter had filled out that he had, you know, never read, of course, um, and had been a gift from him to her for her 13th birthday. And here, you know, he has this great thing in his hand that he has to make sense of. And it took him apparently months to read it. I bet. And bad. more months to decide, am I going to keep this for myself? Am I going to destroy it? Am I going to share it? Am I going to publish it? Um, mm -hmm. And he wound up obviously sharing it with the rest of the world. I want to ask you about that show a little bit more um, later. I remember um, that you did call your show um, honoring Rodney King a prayer for a season of loss in that summer of 2012. And I know that in the play you cite King's memoir, The Riot Within, uh, that came out just before or just yeah. after? Back just, in? just that spring, just before his uh, passing, those of us who cared about Rodney King, mm -hmm. and I was certainly <laughs> one of those people, mm -hmm. um, we felt good because Rodney was on his way back. Mm -hmm. He had had a lot of challenges over the years, um, but he was doing book tours. He was making public appearances. Um, he was uh, well regarded in, in public uh, circles and was getting you know, some really good um, focus. Uh, in the media. Um, so to have lost him the way that we lost him in June of that year was uh, particularly disturbing mm -hmm. because, you know, we had thought that he was, he was on the comeback trail. Mm -hmm. This was 20 years after uh, the events of, of 1992. Yeah, and it had been a hard road for him. You show us that in the performance. It's fascinating to me that in that show, you don't play Rodney King, but you address him. Can you speak a little bit about that choice? Well, I don't look like Rodney King, so I wasn't going to play him mm -hmm. per se, although I wanted to perform his speech, his May Day speech, May 1st, 1992 speech in its entirety. Can we, can we, can we all get along? Can we can we get a long speech, which I think is one of the great American speeches. And we don't hear it in its entirety. In fact, we only heard it in its entirety probably one time, the, the time that it was captured live. And after that, it was truncated and misappropriated and misquoted and uh, used for a variety of purposes, even comically on In Living Color. Uh, and among other places, even his own children, uh, when he would chastise them, would come back to him and say, Dad, can't we all get along? Can't we get along, Dad? Um, but I, I thought that it was important to, to hear that speech in its entirety. I thought it was also important that we hear Willie D uh, say F Rodney King. Uh, mm -hmm. He was one of the ghetto boys, a uh, rap group out of Houston, Texas, and Rodney King did not live up to his ideal of machismo. Uh, he didn't like the idea that uh, Rodney King had sympathetic things to say about a security guard who had lost his life mm -hmm. on the streets of LA in 92. And so he created this rap called F Rodney King. And I wanted to do a snatch of that as well, because I thought that it was important to hear 
a perspective, particularly from another black man uh, about Rodney King, which was not sympathetic to Rodney King. And those were my narrative bookends for the piece. And within, I found a way of improvising uh, what I call the post-mortem uh, interview with Rodney King mm -hmm. uh, from a kind of generic uh, journalist, if you will. And one rule that I think worked for me was that I took the personal pronoun I out of the equation in reference to Roger and, and, uh, and try to focus myself in on asking Rodney King these questions, which obviously he couldn't answer. Mm -hmm. So there are many more questions in the piece than there are possibly answers. Yeah, you bring so many conflicting um, experiences together uh, that mm -hmm. allow us to know more about that violence, but not give us any kind of a clear answer about who we are, what to do in relationship to it. And the show is rough. It's really harrowing. Um, and at the same time, this really vital act of historical and social remembering, um, you give us a way to look at these experiences um, that's otherwise very difficult. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult thing. But as you said, uh, Stephanie, I, initially intended it as a prayer, a meditation in a season of loss. And I had no idea that it would expand beyond that summer, beyond that fall, <laughs> into the next year and the year after that and the year after that, because the tale of Rodney King continued to be tragically relevant. Mm -hmm. And even that fall, the um, autopsy report came out and it was revealed um, you know, that Rodney King had expired in his backyard swimming pool because of a combination of a variety of substances which he, you know, which he had, uh, which he had taken into his body. But it was also revealed that the only uh, abnormality in his body was an, an enlarged heart. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that kind of meant everything that he had dug deeply into that enlarged heart to deliver that tremendous speech uh, in which he asks us, can we, can, we, can we all get along? And he answers that question at the end of the speech when he says, yes, we can, we can, we can get along. We just have to, you know, we have to, we have to work it out. Mm -hmm. um, a speech that was given under great duress a uh, speech that was improvised, a uh, speech that was given by a man who was probably drunk. He was definitely brain damaged. Mm -hmm. He was disappointed that the, you know, the verdicts had come down, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, not guilty, in that Simi Valley courtroom. Um, and most tragically, he was seeing all these people dying in his name but he was able to pull it together and you know, deliver what I have referred to as the, the gospel according to Rodney King. Um, and he was given a script by his lawyers, ironically, the same lawyers who forbade him to testify during the trial against the officers who had beaten him because they didn't think that it would be a good look for a big black man to stand up in court and testify on his own behalf. Mm -hmm. So he was, uh, he was, um, you know, censored from speaking up against the guys who had, who had taken that baton to him. I'm really grateful that that show restores his voice. Um, and, you know, is also, you know, from his enlarged heart and yours, this, this incredible act of love. Um, that gives us perhaps an opportunity to change our minds, um, to change the world. You know, we've continued to see these police lynchings and public murders of Black people. 
And we know that that present moment is connected to Rodney King's story, you know, whose first telling on video was almost 30 years ago now. And these recordings, they're like, you know, snuff films that are otherwise illegal in which the public is called to watch police assaults and murders of black men and women and children over and over again. Um, do you well, remember uh, where you were or um, about the news airing of the video of George Floyd's murder by officer Derek Chauvin? Well, I was here in Los Angeles again and um, I remember that it was Memorial Day and I remembered that I was thinking of the original Memorial Day, which actually was invented uh, by black people in Charleston, South Carolina, um, who buried uh, the bodies of Union soldiers who had been thrown into a mass grave uh, during the Civil War. And the bodies were dug up and uh, reinterred. And there was music and marching and uh, lots of songs were sung and children participated. And this was in fact the first uh, Memorial Day in American history. And then we fast forward to what went down on the streets of uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, which was almost exactly 100 years after three men, black men who worked in the circus in Duluth, Minnesota were lynched because of an alleged you know, sexual assault. And it is said that Bob Dylan, who was from Hibbing, uh, Minnesota, his father witnessed that and told the young Bob uh, uh, about what had happened then. And it uh, inspired a song called Desolation Row. Uh, and uh, the first line is, uh, they're selling postcards of the hanging, the circuses in town. And that's how Dylan, um, Dylan kind of recycled history in uh, popular music. And then this gentleman whose picture is over my left shoulder here, uh, Mr. Huey Newton, listened to Dylan over and over and over mm -hmm. again as he and Bobby Seale were organizing the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense mm -hmm. in Oakland. California in 1966. Mm -hmm. And all of those things went through my mind as the life was being stomped uh, out of uh, George Floyd Memorial Day 2020. And we got a vision of that through the telephone slash camera of a 17 year old girl. Her name was Darnella Frazier. And she does this incredible witnessing for us as well, standing there just um, taking in that uh, historical violence. Um, I find the footage so painful that particular video too painful to watch, knowing what's going to happen. I, I, I begin watching it, feeling the responsibility to witness, to kind of stand with uh, Donald mm -hmm. Fraser there. And then I, I always have to shut it off because I, I find that uh, tolerating that kind of pain is just, I, 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 I find myself there with him and I find myself pulling away. Um, and this is something that uh, your work helps us to do helps us to witness more powerfully this violence that we have to be responsible for as citizens. Well, at the end of Rodney King's speech, 
as I performed it there on the East River, New York City. I appended the final words of another man by the name of Eric Garner, mm -hmm. who perished in Staten Island, New York City. Um, he was uh, choked to death by Officer Pantaleo, who did no time. And he said, I can't breathe. And I appended that to the end of Rodney King's speech. Um, I think in indication, yes, of course, that, you know, the story continues and it continues in an adjacent borough. Mm -hmm. um, but also this idea of cultural, social, racial, economic strangulation, asphyxiation uh, continues. Mm -hmm. And little did we know that when those words of Garner were appended to the words of King, that they would also be the last words of George Floyd as he expired mm -hmm. there on the concrete. Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, not a, uh, it's not an uplifting story, but it is a story from which we can and I think must learn. And that lesson is um, that the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Mm -hmm. And we must always be uh, self-protective, not only of our liberties, but of our breath. Mm -hmm. uh, A lot of people risked their breath. The extended public protest was so meaningful uh, to see masses of people in city after city in the streets for week after week. Um, something about this choking disease and people being at home and watching really perhaps that lynching of George Floyd for the first time in the context of long histories of anti-Black violence in the midst of this disease that steals our breath at the marking of 100,000 dead in the US of coronavirus, um, COVID-19. Um, there's something so bold, uh, risk-taking about all the folks who marched and marched and marched um, in response uh, to Floyd's murder. Well, the march is ongoing. Mm -hmm. And the march began in 1492 and continued in 1619 and 1865 and 1919. Uh, we have been marching and we have been resisting and we have done it um, amongst ourselves and we have sometimes done it in collaboration with allies. Mm -hmm. And uh, the march uh, continues. Uh, it must. Where we were in uh, 2012, uh, when we lost Rodney in his backyard swimming pool, mm -hmm. uh, is not the same America uh, as in 2021, uh, where we have just witnessed the sacking of the U.S. Capitol. And I thought on that day, the Three Kings Day, um, a sacred day uh, on the religious calendar, to those of you who have grown up in the culture that I grew up in, in the Black Catholic Church, mm -hmm. um, I thought immediately of those who had built that capital mm -hmm. in, in both a physical and a spiritual and historical sense. Mm -hmm. um, those who were never meant to enjoy the fruits of American 
liberty, mm -hmm. democracy, and yet who labored uh, without pay mm -hmm. to build this extraordinary edifice. And now that edifice is being sacked, mm -hmm. uh, being desecrated. Uh, the Confederate flag is being waved in the middle of uh, the Capitol uh, hallway, mm -hmm. right in front of a portrait of John C. Calhoun, who was a South Carolinian uh, racist and mm -hmm. uh, insurrectionist mm -hmm. uh, in his own right in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And then in front of another portrait of Charles Sumner, who was a radical uh, Republican, when Republican meant something, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. senator right. uh, who was caned uh, almost to death on the floor of the house. Mm -hmm. um, an extraordinary literal juxtaposition of the Confederate flag waving mm -hmm. between Sumner and John C. Calhoun. Mm -hmm. um, one couldn't have art directed it any better. <laughs> now I had a mentor, uh, his name was uh, Jim Miller, a historian who used to always say that the South lost the war, and thus the Confederate flag never flew over the Capitol building, but won the ideology of the United States um, with this uh, uh, deep sense of white supremacy um, that you're telling us is manifested in this illegal storming of the Capitol to overthrow the US government um, here in 2021. Uh, there's so many deep white supremacist ironies here. You know, we, we had Colin Kaepernick who was really, um, uh, censured for simply kneeling to protest police violence and you have insurrectionists beating police to death with an American flag on the Capitol steps. This is 2021, not 1865. Well, Frederick Douglass said in 1861, the power given to crush the black man now overwhelms the white man. Mm -hmm. The nation has put one end of the chain around the ankle of the slave and the other end around its own neck. Mm -hmm. They've been planting tyrants and they're now getting a harvest of civil war and anarchy. And that mm -hmm. process is, is still with us in this particular moment. Mm -hmm. So what Douglas was trying to tell us uh, in 1861, as Fort Sumter was had fallen, uh, is is still applicable today, as the capital is overrun with uh, a crowd which includes uh, military okay. <laughs> and police, uh, the and elected leaders and elected officials. Mm -hmm. Uh, our next door neighbors, our co-workers, uh, you know, this was not an invasion of aliens. These are American people with whom we interact every day in a variety of ways. In a variety of ways. Um, indeed, you uh, and the, you know, force of um, police power we saw against the peaceful protesters uh, in what's now called Black Lives Matter after the murder of George Floyd. And so the police response couldn't be more different. And a lot of people have testified to this or, or thought this through when thinking about the weak um, uh, response to the insurrectionists at the Capitol. Well, if you've heard uh, some of the testimony from the black officers mm -hmm. who were part of the Capitol Police Force, mm -hmm. uh, you will hear people feeling let down, mm -hmm. uh, that they are part of a force that had been infiltrated, mm 
mm -hmm. that they could not get the kind of uh, support that they felt that they deserved and that they needed to protect themselves, to protect their own lives, mm -hmm. uh, let alone the, <laughs> the edifice of the Capitol building. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, uh, that's very disturbing, but uh, not surprising when we look at uh, the history of this, of this country and how, um, how the status of what we call democracy has been blatantly infiltrated by uh, powers that have nefarious uh, goals. Mm -hmm. It is a really profound question. What is the value of democracy in the United States? Because the, um, the devaluation, the overthrow of it um, that we saw in the Capitol steps is, uh, puts democracy really in crisis, I think, by uh, you know, folks who aren't really offering any other kind of a governmental system, but certainly have been its beneficiaries for hundreds of years when you think historically. I, I also know that you've done these intimate biographical studies, particularly yeah. black men in US history, that of which Rodney King is a part. You looked um, carefully at Frederick Douglass. You have a show, a solo show about Huey Newton. Um, I've seen your work on Jimi Hendrix. Uh, and it seems like the work on Rodney King, these two are really very interested in thinking about the promises of democracy, the questions, possibilities, and failures of freedom, particularly when it comes to race in the US. Or not. Because Rodney King maybe just wanted to go skiing. Mm -hmm. Maybe he just wanted to surf. Mm -hmm. Maybe he just wanted to celebrate with his friends and, and drink old English 800 while listening to De La Soul and roll down the highway, uh, mm -hmm. inebriated, DUI. Um, maybe that's all he wanted. Maybe he wasn't trying to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, an icon a symbol. I don't think that he set out that night in order to, to be that. Um, I'm sure George Floyd didn't set out the evening that he went out um, thinking that he was going to somehow be an iconic uh, symbol of police brutality. Um, these are men who simply wanted to live their lives in the best way that they possibly could, how they saw fit, who did not feel that they were, you know, entering into some kind of carousel of, of indignity. Mm -hmm. But that's where they wound up because in many ways, who we have been in this hemisphere has been determined by those who would degrade us, mm -hmm. who would exploit us, who would have us build a White House and build a capital and build a nation with no uh, plan to include us within the benefit of said White House capital nation. Mm -hmm. And there's this tension in your work that we see so clearly in King of that uh, dichotomy between what history calls people to be and what it feels like just to live in one's own life according to one's choices and legacies, um, dreams and failures. Uh, we see that very clearly with King. Um, and in so many of these other projects. I know that you mentioned that Rodney King uh, project has led to work on Otto Frank. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the Frank project, the Otto Frank project. Well, Otto Frank is a very interesting man. We think we know a lot about his daughter through the diary that she wrote, mm -hmm. um, which is the most read book of, uh, nonfiction, second only to the Bible. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And it has obviously been translated into many languages, many editions over a number of years. And it's kind of standard reading for middle school, high school uh, students in this country. Mm -hmm. um, Otto Frank uh, was uh, born in Germany. Uh, he fought in World War I. He was ordered, he was, uh, he was given the uh, Iron Cross for his distinguished service for the Germans in World War I. He, as a young man, lived for a time in New York City. He had a good friend uh, who, with whom he studied in Europe, whose family ran Macy's, a department store. And he was invited to come over to New York and he actually worked at Macy's for some time. And the loss of his father uh, forced him to return home. And later when he had his own family and things were getting tight for Jewish people in Europe, he uh, tried to get to New York uh, through his old uh, Macy's uh, connections, but it didn't work because all of the records were destroyed in Rotterdam when Rotterdam was bombed. Mm -hmm. And so he was unable to come with his family, uh, his wife and, and two daughters uh, to the United States. He also tried to get to Cuba and uh, that didn't happen uh, either. So he took his family from Germany to uh, Amsterdam and eventually had to go into hiding. We know the story. Uh, in a small attic above uh, his business there. And they were eventually found out and sent to the camps. And he was the only uh, survivor of the Nazi death camps in his immediate family. He lost his wife and two daughters. And he returned after the war to uh, Amsterdam, knowing that he had lost his wife, but hoping that his daughters were still alive. And he found, of course, that they were not. They had uh, both perished, probably of a typhus epidemic in the Bergen-Belsen camp. And then he was handed this diary and it's a diary that was actually a gift from him to Anna for his, her 13th birthday. And she would write in it every day and then she would hand it to him uh, and trust it to him and he would put it in his briefcase and then she would get it the next evening, and so on and so forth. Of course, he never violated her trust, never read it. So one can only imagine what it took to, to read that for a father to read the diary of a daughter uh, whom he had lost. And so there was a, you know, there was a big, uh, you know, there was a big issue within this man's mind, within this man's heart about sharing it or not sharing it with the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And she did have ambitions, as we know. And, and so he went with his daughter's ambitions and shared it with the world. And, it became a radio play and it became a stage play and it became a featured film. And, uh, you know, it is performed in many languages, continues to be performed all over the world. And he became, you know, uh, kind of the bearer of her brilliance. Mm -hmm. And he lived a long and productive uh, life to 90 some odd years old. Remarried, he remarried, uh, married a woman who uh, was a survivor uh, as well, she and her daughter. She had lost uh, her son and her husband. And her son, interestingly enough, was a painter whose paintings were hidden during the war 
and then you know miraculously uh, appeared uh, they were set under some floorboards mm -hmm. and i actually heard her daughter eva schloss mm -hmm. speak a couple of years ago in downtown la she was an exact contemporary of 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 anne and one thing that was quite memorable was her chastising Otto Frank um, and saying, Otto, you're paying far too much attention to the dead and you're ignoring the living because he was a grandfather. She had children whom she felt were being ignored because he was focusing far too much on deceased people. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite a compelling story. And as with all of my stories, it doesn't exist only in the historical moment or as a function of nostalgia. When we think of this story in the 1940s, we think of more recent stories where uh, a recent president of the United States went to the border to witness the installation of barbed wire and said that there is nothing more beautiful than barbed wire when used properly. The presence of fascism uh, as an American system recently has been pretty terrifying to me. Uh, I also know that you, in addition to having this resonance with global fascism, and I know you have the uh, uh, Panama Canal um, piece that was in production that's about um, also global workers. Your, your work um, extends very far uh, temporally and in terms of significance, and, and you have this power to bring it back home to the present and to specific stories. Um, there's another father who uh, you're working with who is thinking about the legacy of his daughter and her own anti-violence activism in the current moment, is that right? Absolutely. And I have folded the story of uh, Donald Lacey into Otto Frank's story. Um, my good friend, Donald Lacey from the Bay Area, okay. um, lost his 16 year old daughter uh, in a drive-by shooting. And um, she had remarkably already begun anti-violence community organizing in Oakland. And she- At 16? and before and caught a stray bullet. And Donald has been organizing in her name uh, over all of these years um, to you know, work on uh, this thing called peace uh, in Oakland, uh, California specifically. Uh, community which has not known peace, uh, but which always struggles for it. Mm -hmm. And actually yesterday, uh, we celebrated, commemorated what would have been his daughter Loeche's 40th birthday. And there was testimony from good friends, in fact, a best friend, who had been with her the night uh, in which we lost her. And it's extraordinary what light her loss has uh, lent us all. And Mr. Lacey actually went to San Quentin prison to embrace the man who had shot and killed his daughter in an extraordinary gesture uh, of forgiveness and was responsible for this man 
receiving parole. Um, and he's going yeah. out from, and sorry. Many, one of the one of the people who brought testimony to yesterday's gathering had lost his son in a similar fashion and uh, said straight up he didn't think that he was there yet and he didn't know if he would ever get there and Otto Frank asked this question. He says, could I, would I, could I, could I, should I, would I ever forgive those who are responsible for your death? Like that great man in California, Oakland, who went to prison, San Quentin, to embrace the man who had shot and killed his 16-year-old daughter. You see him? The killer. On TV. He looks like he's about to cry. Daddy? I hear you ask. Yes, darling. Daddy? Yes, darling. What's a drive-by? It's Anna. It's just another way to die. So obviously this is not a conversation that Otto Frank had with his daughter, Anne Frank. Um, he speaks to Anna beyond her own time. He speaks actually beyond his own time as well. But, you know, this is what we do imaginatively, creatively uh, in the theater to try to enjoin eras um, so that we come to some sort of conclusive emotion mm -hmm. that helps us survive. The emotional power of the work really gives us greater strength, more deep understanding, I think, to try and access these unimaginable things. Um, one of the questions you've asked, and I think continue to, to prove, is uh, how we as artists and citizens continue to illuminate these dark corners of the American psyche. Mm. Not just history, um, but the way we think and feel our way through uh, time and difficulty. Well, if we saw the inauguration, we know that perhaps the most memorable moment was a bit of poetry, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if the speeches are as memorable. I don't know if the songs are as, are as memorable. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we look to the poetic form, to the theatrical form for guidance that uh, we're not necessarily given in the traditional political process. And it is only poetry, theater, song on which we can rely because it is, in essence, the life force. Yeah. Thank you so much, Roger.
Denver Smith, <laughs> for your work and for talking us today, uh, to us today, and also for helping us uh, feel our way through some of these harder things that it, no many, no, no number of words um, allows us to understand our way through. Um, if you want to check out Rodney King, the film, a code will be available to you at summerstageanywhere.org. Uh, so you can have a look at the film without a Netflix subscription. Thank you all for joining us for this special conversation tonight. Tune in every week for more digital content from Summer Stage Anywhere at summerstageanywhere.org. Thank you so much for Rodney King. Mr. Smith, thank you so much for all of your work and we'll be looking forward to seeing this latest piece on live stages all over. Thank you, Professor. Your work is extraordinary and it is extraordinary to be in continued conversation, uh, not only about this work, but about the world at large. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the next, thank you.